Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us tonight for the live Q&A for Body Swap at the 29th Annual Woods Hole Film Festival. This year, the festival runs from now through midnight on Saturday, August 1st. As Jay said, my name is Sean Volk, and I'm an associate programmer at large for the festival. I'll be moderating tonight's discussion from my apartment in Fargo, North Dakota. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of our festival supporters and sponsors. This festival is made possible by the assistance and the support of many people. And we hope that we will be able to count on you going forward as we continue to develop the virtual screening platform. A few more housekeeping items. All of the films eligible are eligible to receive both an audience and jury award. You can vote for the audience award for the feature films in the screening platform. On the home entry image of each film, you'll see five stars next to the box that says watch later. That's where you'll vote, one for lowest, five for highest. For the short films, we'll send pass and ticket holders further information about how to vote shortly. During today's Q&A, which will last around 40 minutes, I will be speaking with the team from Body Swap for a bit, and then we'll open it up to questions from you, the audience. Please write your questions in the Q&A section, which is in the panel bar at the bottom of the Zoom window that you're seeing. I will then pass your questions along for a response from the filmmakers. Please make sure mute your audio, enjoy, and thank you for being with us today. Q&As are part of what make the festival experience so special, allowing audience members to connect directly with filmmakers. I'm really looking forward to your questions and the exciting directions in which they take our conversation. I'm so excited to speak with the team from Body Swap today. The film is such a good natured and subversive take on the Body Swap narrative, and it features two dynamic performances from leads Ella Jordan and Jimmy Custis. Today, I'm joined by Jimmy and Brandon from the film. So Jimmy and Brandon, if you would, we'll start with you, Jimmy. Can you introduce yourself, talk about your role or roles, because we know you're multi-hyphenate on this one, and then let us know where are you calling in from today, please? Yes, I'm Jimmy Custis. I'm from Louisville, uh, where we shot the film. Um, Brandon's from Louisville, but he's in uh, Arkansas right now. Uh, I uh, wrote and then produced it, which is uh, just a lot of things, and then um, uh, just keep going with it and keep doing things for it. Um, uh, I'm doing the subtitles right now, so when I release it, it has you know a bunch of languages it can be in. And, um, uh, yeah, just uh, cast it and all sorts of things. But the director did a, a bunch too, Tim. Um, he's off uh, on vacation with his girlfriend, so. Um, Very exciting. And then Brandon, what was your role in the film? Can you tell our audience a little bit? Yeah, I'm Brandon Shell. I'm, like I said, calling from, uh, at the moment, I'm somewhere in the Ozarks with very bad reception. In the middle of the woods, I'm in a minivan and I can't see anything except I hear stuff. And they found a bear here. Last week, there was a black bear on this very property. So I'm gonna heighten the suspense. So I might get eaten and you guys can watch it. So that could happen. All right, so I'm gonna throw that little tidbit out there. But when we get the film. You've just elevated like the general sense of danger for a Q&A from like a very like normal range to like right? oh, gosh, bear. So thank you for the heightened stakes I, tonight. <laughs> well, that's something you get from the virtual <laughs> festival is that um, you can do it from your car now. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And I mean, this is all Blair Witch Project stuff. This place is creepy. Like, <laughs> the camera right up in my nose and all that. I'm so scared. So, okay, sorry. Anyways, okay, but in that film, in Body Swap, I played Ted, who was a, a quirky engineer there for a, for a Versa company. Perfect. And uh, yeah, Ted had a lot of great ideas. Uh, pizza Pop-Tarts, for one. And... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I don't even remember. There's a few others. You got to credit the writer for that. But uh, yep. And uh, had a lot of fun. I've worked with Jimmy on a few other things. And uh, yeah. Very cool. All right. Well, thank you both. Jimmy, can you tell us a little bit about where did the idea for the film come from? Um, why was a comedy about body swapping a story that you wanted to tell and bring to the big screen and make a feature film about? Well, in about uh, 2010, there was um, an idea I think maybe like 17 again was out or something and thought there should be an R-rated body swap comedy. Um, and I don't know if that was, 
I definitely yeah, started to write the screenplay uh, with a lot of the ideas in there. And then they had the change up. It wasn't very popular, but that was an R-rated body swap comedy. But uh, this one actually became like PG-13 kind of in a way. And the main idea then was, even though I already wrote it, that it was gender swapping and that that, that hasn't really been done too much. Um, I thought, I think the the basic premise back when I wrote it, when the idea of an already comedy was take the romantic comedy idea of a slob and the businesswoman and mash that with a body swap comedy because they've both been done. So do it in the same movie. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Well, so I wanted to ask you about your choice to have um, the the water kind of knocked into the paper shredder as the body swap incident because I love how normal it is in your film like it makes the magic feel like it's an everyday thing that could happen to any of us like at any given time like why did you decide to do it in that way that was a yeah an original screenplay and um uh it's it was something that stuck uh I changed a lot of things but I liked uh that idea that it was in a uh, shredder Sorry, a shredder, a paper shredder. Yeah. Sorry, it was an important then, point. <laughs> yeah, and then, uh, so we did that and uh, we added a little, we did a, we didn't want the um, sprinklers to go off in our set, so we used dry so the it would just like foam and look like that and have like a surreal feel to it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, that's the independent part is you can't have a big uh thing anyway and that was probably our biggest it was definitely our only effect practically other than putting things on the tv mm -hmm. um everything's practical uh even that was you know kind of practical because we use dry ice and then just we'll add like sparks in the post but yeah you'll even see like the shredder we have a, we have two shredders one's uh regular and one's all messed up and the messed up one got thrown away by my mom i was i was putting all my props in the her garage so she just <laughs> thought it was trash so but uh yeah we had our prop um production designer lauren hirsch smash we we some when you just start making a movie like you're like oh wouldn't it be cool to have a, a messed up one they show that's all melted and smash with the hammer and so she blow torched it and smashed it up with a hammer to make it um messed up very cool to give it that desired effect I yeah. like that. um that's very neat so i wanted to talk with you too about another thing that i think that you do that is very kind of subvers subverting uh the audience expectations in the film is that once our leads find that they have swamped bodies their immediate reaction isn't, oh my gosh, how do we switch back? Uh, you know, it's it kind of seems like something that they hope is inevitable or will happen down the road, but it isn't like this kind of urgent frenzy, like, well, how do we recreate it? How do we do it again? That doesn't come for some time in the story. So why did you choose to um, to do that so early on in the film? Uh, so you kind of sort of, as the audience, get to uh, play with this idea um, and you know um see where it goes um there was a original idea in there that got totally thrown away probably lasted for a good 15 pages of them not figuring it out they didn't figure it out for a long time i mean that's still in there but they thought they were when they they thought they were a ghost like <laughs> are you a ghost i'm a ghost they, they didn't uh quite understand why they could see each other once they like it went to that part where they saw each other and then they still thought they were ghosts after that and it just went on forever and then <laughs> and then they eventually figured it out so that i took out um but um yeah i always try to do that in my screenplays is um i've watched enough movies i've almost stopped watching movies because i watch so many is that uh anything uh i have gone back though and made the screenplays I've written after a bit more movie like where the stakes are higher, but everyone was complaining that I don't make stakes high. I just go, Oh, this happened. <laughs> I, I like to do that in movies. I think, I think so. in real life, that's kind of the case is like, yeah, they're working on a billion dollar deal. Will it go through or not? You know, <laughs> it's a, uh, it's all a part of the journey. 
Well, I'm glad that you brought up the the deal with Versa because I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about and and Brandon too here about like the office culture at Versa because I love um like sitting in on that meeting that starts off as a pitch meeting where where we're hearing about the pizza pop tart and we're seeing kind of like all these levels of office hierarchy how did you like as a writer and then both of you like as actors how did you kind of work in that um that dynamic of creating kind of this very complex work environment even though you know your character initially just comes in for a job interview yeah I, a lot of it is um I like to have contrasting locations in a, a movie where I'm shooting in September with Brandon's also that way where you follow a character that's different in a location that's different. And so I wanted that location to differ from, you know, just his house mm -hmm. with his brother and like they don't live the same life that she does, even though I'm sort of like the corporate culture. It's not, it's not a very, um, I don't know. It's not like high stakes corporate culture, but it's um, it's it's different. People are more professional. So, um, that idea and uh, Brandon actually came up with that also idea, and I we just incorporated on the day was um, him talking about the chairs and how they're how he thinks they're um Japanese chairs, but they're Swedish. You know mm -hmm. that that thing. Um, yeah, I'll let Brandon had... talk. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, we did that. What was neat was Jimmy had set up uh, the producers and Jimmy, I guess, brought us into a, that set was a really nice furniture store that let us, right, that let you shoot there for, okay. uh, on weekends. And it was like high end. So even that, the table we were sitting around, uh, come to find out later on, it was, I think, $11,000 table. I don't know, stuff was pretty, even those, and the little stools I'm handing her off for like a, over a grand, I think, each. Um, but yeah, they were very nice to do that, let us use all that stuff. But then uh, we're in there, so it was, as we were able to really move stuff around and make it look office-y. But uh, yeah, I don't know, the the idea of like, um, well, one of the actors, a lot of it came up when we were shooting, because working with, with Marty Polio, who's uncredited, but he is, the, that's the boss. And he's he does a lot of, well, he does stand-up. He was in, he's done a lot of stuff in the industry. Um, and his demeanor was just really kind of laid back anyways and wishwashy. Like what, whichever way the wind blows is what he wants to do. He just doesn't want to get himself in trouble. As seen when he hands, uh, when he hands Ella like a bunch of money, just to not, just in case uh, there has been a sexual harassment issue. He doesn't know. He just kind of says here, just take this. Just, um, but so a lot of that was just working with, to see how he wanted to do it. I just kind of followed Jimmy. i I don't know, don't have a great answer. Yeah. Well, I... It, it, it worked as, on an independent film. We don't have a whole lot of, a lot of it you get to, well, first of all, we also, we knew the director well. Yeah. And uh, so it was nice to feel comfortable with the actresses, actor, and the director. And so they let us do a lot of different things and we felt pretty good about that. Mm -hmm. Well, and could so, you talk a little bit about what was your experience like making the film um, in Kentucky? Was it all shot on location there? Yes, every scene. Um, can't think of anything shot outside there. Um, oh no, the the you're, uh, the final, the after the crep, the uh, you and Ella in California, right? No, we didn't go there. We didn't go there. Um, we just oh, shot sorry. that in the worst house. Yeah. Just tell them, tell them it's California. Bit. They did this one. In, yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it looked like California. That's good. I mean, maybe maybe there was at one point I was thinking of replacing us with actual names to sell the movie like for that scene but I felt like it was um I felt like the weight loss was a big sell and I, I didn't want someone else playing those characters mm -hmm. so um but no everything was shot in Louisville okay very cool and what was it like kind of working in that local like film community um do you have did you already have a lot of connections there or did you have to kind of like build There's only Variety. There's only about 10 filmmakers in Louisville, um, okay. but we know them all. Yeah. yeah. Um, we know Jack Harlow, who's a big um, musician there. He didn't really help with this one, but his song is in there. Um, but like Archie Borders, you can see his movie um, Under the Eiffel Tower on um, Netflix. Um, Gil Holland, who's a big producer, he, he let us use his soundtrack um, 
he, he has all those artists like Ben Sole. Oh, the soundtrack's mostly Louisville artists too. Um, ben Sole and Jack Harlow and the pass uh, was a ba uh, like an 80 sounding man that we had at the end of the credits and a few songs in there. Okay. Um, uh, so, and we had a lot of connections. Um, there's another filmmaker there called Stu Pollard, but I, we didn't really work with him. But we know we know all of them. So yeah. we just um, here. And it's a decent film scene. It's a small, like I said, small, but it's got a. It's a decent enough sized city that we're able to do a lot of different things there. And there's some, there's been some names that come out, come out of there. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and, and that was one of the things that I, I think I was very curious about, like with that question, is I think so many times people feel a pressure that they need to move somewhere or go somewhere else to tell some kind of story. But I think more often than not, you can find a really kind of cool, magical scenario that comes together for you to make things where you are. And that that is an impediment to your storytelling. It can, it can be drawing upon your resources. It can be finding um, those connections that you have and making something special where you are and then sharing it with the world like you are right now. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, in L.A. has been, they always complain that they every place has been shot. So you get new <laughs> locations that you can film in. Um, it's also... Kentucky's very restrictive right now with COVID. Maybe in September it won't be so bad. But even if it's restrictive, since I'm just shooting at people's houses, I can shoot a movie in September. Even in LA, I don't think you can shoot in people's houses. LA would just, um, California is like a total dictatorship. So <laughs> you can't shoot anything there. And I don't know what they're, I don't know what they're doing. I guess they're all fleeing there to Texas. I heard Joe Grogan's going there. Mm. So they're all, they're all leaving that uh, state. And so there's uh, not much production being done, but, um, yeah. I'm gonna shoot really, another one here. I, soon. Wouldn't, wouldn't you say, wouldn't you say though that the resources is a huge thing, and people in smaller towns like want you to shoot oh. with them. Yeah. You know, where yeah. other ones, other cities in LA and whatnot, they're gonna, you've got to get permits and everything else. I mean, mm -hmm. where we still had to get permits, but you can get people who are like, just wanna, oh, you guys are doing something cool for our city, let's do it. Like we'll jump in for free or let us know how we can help. And that's mm -hmm. a, that's not a hindrance. That's a huge help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. A lot of that stuff, I thought, came together nicely with it. Yeah, yeah, a hundred a day goes a long way when you live in Kentucky instead of New York or California. So people, people well, are, and we were able to bring actors in just for the day from Chicago and Atlanta. Like, there's some other actors mm -hmm. who are really good. Uh, yeah, surrounding areas come down yeah. for the day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think yeah, I just I think that's so exciting because I think. Um, so many of the stories that we see today that are successful, I think, especially within the independent film world are being made where people are. And it's like you said, it's showing us places we haven't seen. It's telling us stories we haven't seen with faces we haven't seen. And that's what's so special. And that's what, you know, I'm so proud of to be, you know, part of the film festival community is getting to kind of give those voices a platform and to, to find them. Um, so I did want to remind everyone that's watching today, if you do have questions, please make sure to submit them through the Q&A portal at the bottom of the panel. I'll be happy to pass them along to Jimmy and Brandon, but otherwise I've got a few more of my own before I start going to yours. Um, so I wanted to ask you, um, since you talked a little bit about that there are a lot of references in the film to video games or future Pixar sequels that are coming down the pipeline. Um, <laughs> could you tell us a, a little bit about, you know, wh why, why was it so important for you to, to have so many either direct quotations or all of these intertextual references in the film? Well, for better or worse, we live in a world where a lot of your experience, especially now, is what you um, consume, you know? So, um, I do like to have it exist in a world where it, there's TV and there's music, and that that really doesn't even happen very much in movies. I, I think because they don't want to go and film a big thing. I mean, the Hallmark thing was more production than anything in the movie. Uh, <laughs> it was the easiest thing because we already shot the movie and we knew what we were doing, but um, and we had help from you know, Archie Borders, who has like the red camera and all that stuff. So if you see that the production value on that's higher than the rest of the movie, that's because it was. Um, and uh, um, yeah, so mm -hmm. 
uh, what was it again? Well, no, I just, I, I wanted to ask, you know, like, like you said, it, it's so much about what we consume, but why was it important to have oh, yeah, the references the brothers, and the brothers quoting and, and even it's funny to see when people don't get the references. Like that's another mm -hmm. layer to the humor too. Like it's yeah. this kind of inside layer that like, well, you're in this and you get this and oh, these people don't, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I think that's, um, it's uh, something, especially things where you reference it and it's, uh, that's why they would like to reference Star Wars. A joke, but everyone's seen Star Wars, you know? So it's all things that, you know, everyone's seen, um, uh, but it's, uh, you know, maybe just a joke here where like, they get switched by Shredder, then he mentions the Shredder, and then the mask is the thing, and the that and that. And so it all sort of, it's sort of like Seinfeld where they tie everything together and um, the references. Yeah. And it's also what goes on inside Jimmy's head. Like, honestly, yeah. I mean, he yeah. is a writer, like, that's what is in his head anyway. <laughs> uh, which, yeah. He has an incredible knowledge, a vast resource, uh, vast resources of. Uh, I guess oh, culture. that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> culture, especially as related to the 90s mm -hmm. yeah. and video games. Very I, I, I purposely hope it has a 90s feel to it. We even did 90s, 8, well, the 80s and 70s style trailers are not out, but we've done four different, oh, four trailers right. yeah. in the styles yeah. of uh, their eras. Okay. So we did a 90s, um, we did a 90s with the guy that does the voice for every airport in the country. He lives in Louisville. So, oh, does um, he? Yeah. And okay. he, um, he does <laughs> like um, the uh, the best picture winner was a Shape of Water. He did the like voice on the little um, uh, uh, intercom where the like, because uh, Del Toro heard him at the airport and put him in there and he did the intercom of the like fish place where they would come out. So we had them do the 90s style and the 70s style like two different ways where the 90s is sort of like a romantic comedy and the 70s is like a um, um, like a sci-fi ooh they switched uh, what's this about sort of thing um, well at least that 70s one sometime but the 90s one's out on YouTube you can just look up 90s style trailer and you'll see that one very cool well I so I wanted to ask you I know you mentioned it a little bit but one of my favorite gags in the movie is opening with that Hallmark Christmas movie and how appropriate that we're watching this movie together for Woods Hole in July, with like the Christmas in July that Hallmark yeah, right. does all the time. Yeah. But I think yeah. it's so funny how well you key in on the visual language of one of those films because instantly, like I don't care who you are, you know what style of movie he's watching, you know it's a made for TV holiday film. Um, but I wanted to ask you why why go with that one versus maybe another kind of genre that you could kind of eat otherwise like replicate too that has like a very distinctive visual style? What made you decide like the Hallmark Christmas movie feel? Well, my mom watches a lot of them and I was like, um, thought, oh, that's funny because it's, it's got a different style than this, um, the main movie. And um, I kind of have an idea of a sequel where uh, I don't know if I'll ever make it, but the Hallmark movie is the main movie and then Body Swap 2 is a movie they're watching on the other side of, it's just a reality on the other side. Like TV is not actually being um, filmed. Mm -hmm. It's a, just a different reality they're watching, which is kind of what we did in our first movie, New Cops, is he would watch something on TV. Um, it's not a, it's not a like a super popular movie, but um, uh me and the director made that one first and it it was like a zero budget. Um, we just made it in our spare times and they would watch a, a show called New Cops and he would uh, dream about New Cops and then he would dream about being president, which is a different thing. And then he would um, uh, be in reality and reality was boring. And that, that was the sort of thing. So we always like a TV or movie within the um, universe. Okay, that's neat. Can I can I say that I thought it worked really well because it also sets out to this uh, cookie cutter type love story, mm -hmm. right? You, like you said, you know what you're going to get into and, and then all of a sudden it cuts to him and you realize you're going to see a body swap romance where he, he's going to end up 
uh, courting himself. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Being intimate with it. It's a, just the, a, it's like a, it's like cold water thrown on the, on the, um, the Christmas romance films, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all the romance, um, all the different types of love you see and stuff is always so weird. Like this is the main movie of Body Swap probably is how I would like love to be. It's not really reality where you like just fall in love with the type of person and not um, like just uh, sort of like a spiritual love. And then the whole, the like regular Hollywood movies are a different type. And then the Hallmark is a, a strange type because it's like I put it in there where it's like, I'm going to give up my dreams for you. They, that comment <laughs> that's very common in Hallmark is like, you're going to give up your dreams for, for love. And like, that is the concept of love I can ever think of is like, just give up who you are to be. <laughs> you know, this who you are. Just, it's like yeah. all of them. So yeah. I, I find that funny. Well, and I loved it too, because didn't it like, wasn't it a Christmas tree farm that he came there to it was work? A Christmas it's a Christmas tree yeah. farm. And that's but... not far from some of the plot lines, I think. It, definitely... oh, it is a plot line. My wife told me it was an actual plot line from one of them. <laughs> you heard it. We were cracking up. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Sorry. Well, so... I get excited about it. No, I, th I thought it was such a funny way. And like, and, you know, like I said, it just, those films have such a distinctive look that you could be walking by a TV like from across the room or like even in like a Best Buy or something. And you would see that and go, oh, Hallmark Christmas movie. So I just, I thought that was such a, like a smart way to even kind of open up because your, your treatment of the romantic comedy isn't conventional. Like I think it's, I think it's a very kind of smart subversion of it. Um, so it's fun to, to kind of open the waters with, well, you're seeing this on screen, but that's not the kind of movie we're gonna give you. We're gonna be doing something a little bit different, which I think is cool. Um, so Jimmy, I wanted to ask you, could you talk about what it was like working with Ella and then crafting kind of these dual roles of Casey as CJ and CJ as Casey? Because I think that there have to be a heck of a lot of trust that gets developed between um, actors kind of in that capacity. But then also we have a very kind of limited amount of time that we as viewers that we're watching it going, okay, well, this is who they are. This is what it's like. And then they switch roles so quickly. Could you talk a little bit about how did you, like as an actor, um, work to kind of have that relationship with her? And then also how did you start to play like someone else being in your body? Oh, um, well, uh, when I was casting, I, I thought she was just uh, very sarcastic and kind of, uh, one of the things I found from casting is if the, uh, a uh, lady I was switching with mm -hmm. um, is very feminine and not like me. I guess I'm, I guess I got soft face, like he says, but like, um, if, if, <laughs> I needed someone that was, Ella and I are very similar. Uh, sometimes it like creates a lot of butting heads, but like you see on the couches, uh, like I'm, we're all constantly ribbing each other. But um, because we're very similar, it was actually easier I noticed that from the auditions is it's just easier. Um, all I have to do is, you know, play a character and she plays a character um, for a little bit of time. And then, um, you know, the rest we can, uh, I don't know, like she's not a businesswoman at all until she, after the movie ended, she got an office job in New York, um, but she was doing the acting thing in LA at the time. And she never had a, nine to five job she just did um college and then did the acting and modeling thing so she sort of became the office worker and then i um uh did lose a lot of weight so it became very um <laughs> similar in a lot of ways of real life but uh yeah uh that's is that's the thing is it's just you have to um really only play a character when you're um the woman part <laughs> she's very uh got a masculine energy in a lot of ways she says she's not a very girly girl although yeah. she does like makeup and starbucks and girly girl stuff so i don't know what she meant by that but she's you know she can be sarcastic and stuff like that that uh, made the character work well and i think i think that you both do such a good job of like the physicality of kind of like this almost like this sense of otherness where 
when you're watching you both after the switch, you can tell that there's kind of like this level of discomfort, like something's a little off or like you're, you're not quite sure how to navigate the space now because it's a different body. So I just really want to give both of you kudos because I think that the two of you do an excellent job kind of leading the cast and, and really selling the whole thing. So excellent, excellent. Work. Oh, thank you. Yeah. She got, um, her and Katie got nominated at the Houston. Houston was going to go ahead in April and then they got um, canceled, but they let us know the wins and nominations and she got the, they both got us actress and supporting actress nominations. So I was oh, happy to see good. that. Mm -hmm. Um, that's awesome. That That's, that's really good. Um, so you had talked about, you know, you, you had already, um, you've played at a couple of festivals. How has that run been going? Do you have the hopes for getting the film distributed maybe through a BOD platform or do you have any um, kind of plans kind of down the road with the film or, or how do you hope more people will see this? Um, I got it on, on Vimeo on demand. You can just subscribe to their pro three pre-orders and I got it for late August release, but I might get, I might delay it and much to those chagrin of the three pre-orders, but the three pre-orders I'm very happy with because it's a month out and I haven't advertised it at all. So people just might have just found it through Vimeo, but um, there's about six platforms you can self-distribute through that are very big iTunes, Amazon, Fandango, nice. um, Voodoo, all those. And I think it's going to cost like 4,000 if I do it right to get on those. Um, so uh, they have various splits. I think uh, after you've paid that 2000, then you get all the money that iTunes after the iTunes takes their cut. So they may take 30% Amazon takes 40 and I don't know what the rest do, but um, so yeah, I'll probably just go that route. Um, I did submit to a lot of fall festivals because it kept going up the ranks. It premiered at a um, Northern Michigan town with 9,000 people third year of a film festival or second year, um, you know, two or three films and it was two or three features, a bunch of shorts that were local. And, um, you know, we have no Tasman in Northern Michigan. We just, I just drove up with my friend um, and we went and it was a fun time. And uh, that was a small one. And on the way there, I learned of three or four festivals that got into that were relatively big, like, you know, um, you know, 10 and, 14 year festivals. And then in 2020, um, we started getting into ones where they would get a thousand submissions or 4,000 and uh, we'd still get in and we get wins and all this stuff. So it's like, we've gotten like, this is a 29th year of a film festival. The Houston one was a 53 year, you know, before that was like 14 and 10 year ones. And then two or three year ones were where we premiered at. So you don't see that in, um, at all hardly um that route's kind of um it wasn't uh, super expensive for us because we got a lot of waivers but if you did it that route <laughs> you'd go broke because you're supposed to sort of like premiere it's can and then get a bunch of waivers because everyone wants your can movie but um uh i didn't know how to do it i just submitted to every i submitted like sundance and then when i didn't get in i just submitted everywhere and then whoever took me uh i went with and it yeah. got turned down by like 10 or 12. And I was like, well, I'll take this small one in Michigan. And then it got a few bigger and bigger and more awards. So. Well, and, I th and I think that that's the thing too, is that there is, there is so much opportunity for films and content to find audiences through unconventional routes nowadays. And like you said, with the pandemic, um, there more often than not, people are, are home more than ever looking for new things to watch. So it's, it's a fun time to try something new and to experiment. Well, yeah, there's going to be a huge gap in movies for a while. Like they're, they're sitting on a few, they're sitting on quite a few that they were going to release in theaters. So they're spacing those out. And so this is a time, if you've had an independent film in the can, you can um, get some traction with it. I think body swap would have done, it was doing better and better and it got into Houston before the pandemic. So it was like, um, I don't think that's why we got into ones, but yeah, <coughs> no. I'm no, not choking I, up, but I'm literally yeah. choking right now because uh, yeah. God, I don't know a crumb or something in there. But <laughs> uh, yeah, so we are probably going to release it here soon, and, um, and uh, yeah, but uh, if you got one, it's a good time, and then um, 
I was going to give some independent filmmaker advice, but I forgot what that was. Um, uh, oh, well, even like you oh, said, like a, well, there's a movie called Beanpole. I, I watch, I look at a lot of the films and how they heck festival runs are. And there was this movie, they tell you, oh, have your premiere at this big festival. And Beanpole did premiere at a big festival, but like New York Film Festival, AFI, Berlin, you know, play at like five of these huge ones that say they only take premieres, but you know, it, all five of them played Beanpole, this foreign film that everyone liked that wasn't, um, I don't think it starred anyone, definitely no one in America would know. Um, and there's, there's other ones like that portrait of a lady on fire that, you know, would have a big run. So just different f people had different festival runs. Um, we never did the huge one, but, um, maybe we'll do that with the next picture or we just will skip the festival run. We're not sure. Um, but uh, I was very pleased with how it turned out and that I got to see it with like five or six audiences. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Well, and you know, we've got time for about two more questions here. So I wanted to ask you one kind of final question about the film itself and the content. Um, because one thing that I was really moved by is very early on kind of in those moments of confessionals, both CJ and Casey each admit to experiencing some kind of isolation or just kind of this lack of connection in their life. I was wondering if you could maybe tell us a little bit about why was loneliness a theme you wanted to examine kind of through the lens of a romantic comedy? Because I, I, I think that on the outside, it might not seem like a good fit, but you do it in, in a way that it really feels like these two people are, you know, kind of being driven to each other which I think really works and is very cool. Yeah, I think it's, uh, there has been, um, the director told me after he made it, he's like, oh, I read an article, there's a loneliness epidemic. And I think, yeah, um, there's like a mouse utopia type thing where people, especially now, are like uh, quarantined or whatever. Um, and maybe some people are quarantined with other people. So uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if they're lonely or not, but uh, um, yeah, I think it was a, a issue in America that I wanted to tackle. There's a lot of different things I wanted to address, uh, gender. Mm -hmm. I mean, this happens. I, I wrote a screenplay on February. I finished it up, bam, finished. It's got about five or six things that happen after that. It's got mask. It's, I mean, it's a horror film. It's got mask. It's got African-American issues. It's got, um, uh, uh, the media and how are like it doesn't even have the media but it has like what's real and what's not and the you know that's a sort of a like the media will say one thing and then another thing and then it's got like uh yeah so I can't even describe all the things that when I make that it'll feel like I wrote it after uh March but it I wrote it all before March yeah so just cert certain things happen, and I'm sure Body Swap's the same way where it touches on a bunch of things that were maybe just on the periphery and I sort of was uh, zoned in on that. Yeah, well, and, and, and now seem kind of newly resonant too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so I wanted to ask um, for both of you now, what, it, like for our audience that has seen the film that's watching the Q&A tonight, what is a way that um, we can kind of help you like support the film and get the film out there? Are there, is there a website or a newsletter you'd like us to subscribe to social media platforms? You know, what can well, we do to help you spread the word about the movie? Oh, I mean, bodyswapmovie.com is great. If you can tell people to look up the trailer, um, uh, the trailer's on bodyswapmovie.com. Just right there. I'll take you. You can pre-order it. Um, I can redirect it to wherever if, something updates where I want it, but I got the pre-order page up on that. So Very um, that's a great way if you want it, if you like the movie and you wanted to see it again, uh, that would help me. Um, uh, I, I'm happy with how it's turned out. I, I don't, uh, 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 it gave me a lot of, uh, it's probably the reason I lost weight. I wrote a little bit about losing weight in the movie and probably was expecting it to give me some motivation, but it's like, if I can accomplish a big project without, you know, with a limited crew, um, Tim really helped out with that because he can do so many things the director. Um, that I can't. Uh, the big thing I can't do, it, I can do repetitive tasks, but I cannot watch 
editing of I could I could not edit any movie, let alone with me in it. Uh, it's it's too repetitive. I would get up and eat or walk around every five seconds that I had to do that, and was um, it's just uh, it's just too tedious for me. But um, after I got that accomplished, I felt like I could uh, lose weight, and that, that even when I'm talking on the couch, that's uh, that was improvised stuff. I was about the few uh that those scenes were the few that weren't scripted and uh stuff came out that we uh personally felt uh the thing about the me not liking authority or bosses that's very much me in real life i don't i don't very much go for being told what to do <laughs> um so uh that came out and then i said this is my one body i better take care of it and that that's true of real life that I saw on there. Well, thank you both so much for joining us today. And um, remember, everyone, if you'd like and you want to support the film, you can go to, it was Body Swap Movie, right? Bodyswapmovie.com. Go to Bodyswapmovie.com to learn more about the film, watch the trailer, sign up for pre-orders if you liked it and you want to watch it. Also, please remember all of the features that you watch and the shorts in the Woods Hole Film Festival are eligible for the audience award. So in the film platform where you watch the film, right next to that watch later button, there are five stars. You'll wanna rank each film that you watch one to five, five stars being the best. Brandon and Jimmy, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. And I in Woods Hole for a festival in person. Well, uh, with I'll probably go to more of these uh, Zoom events. If I, I figure out how to log on to them, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> no, it's into, like the, the virtual barrier, like as you're kind of figuring life out, like it's a, it's been like a weird adjustment, but I feel like people have gotten like oddly proficient at. So it's, it's good to kind of see us like kind of stretching these muscles. So thank you both. And, you know, yeah, I really Sean. appreciate it. Well, we appreciate being part of it. Yeah. yeah, we'll be up there next year. Yes. Yes, come for 30. With, uh, it's a nice big round number. You're right. With uh, She's a Princess or uh, one of the things we got going on, right, Jimmy? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the next one, She's a Princess. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks, thank guys. Yeah, thank you both so much. And thank you all for watching. Please remember to vote for Audience Awards. And I'll see you for other Q&As later. Have an excellent night, everyone. Thank you thanks, so John. much. Thanks, Jay. Thank you. It was nice.